Well, good day to you all, dear ones, and welcome to this fifth day of August. It is day 217 in our journey through the Bible. Hello to everyone out there. My name is Hunter. I am your brother, your Bible reading coach, somebody who shows up with you every day to spend a little time together in the pages of the Bible. And <laughs> we're going to let the Bible do what the Bible does and direct our hearts to the one who is the living word of God, the one alone who has the words of life. And so we come from all around this beautiful world. We arrive here to warm our hearts by the fires of God's love. For our God is a consuming fire and our God is love. And today, my friends, we are going to look into the book of 2 Kings, chapter 23, 2 Chronicles 35, and then we'll finish our reading in John's Gospel, chapter 7. Father, thank you for drawing us here today. Help us to see. 2 Kings 23. Then King Josiah summoned all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up to the temple of the Lord with all the people of Judah and Jerusalem, along with the priests and the prophets, all the people from the least to the greatest. There the king read to them the entire book of the covenant that had been found in the Lord's temple. The king took his place of authority beside the pillar and renewed the covenant in the Lord's presence. He pledged to obey the Lord by keeping all his commands, laws, and decrees with all his heart and soul. In this way, he confirmed all the terms of the covenant that were written in the scroll, and all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. Then the king instructed Hilkiah the high priest and the priest of the second rank and the temple gatekeepers to remove from the Lord's temple all the articles that were used to worship Baal, Asherah, and all the powers of the heavens. The king had all these things burned outside Jerusalem on the terrace of the Kidron Valley, and he carried the ashes away to Bethel. He did away with the idolatrous priests who had been appointed by the previous kings of Judah, for they had offered sacrifices at the pagan shrines throughout Judah, and even in the vicinity of Jerusalem. They had also offered sacrifices to Baal and to the sun and the moon, the constellations and to all the powers of the heavens. The king removed the Asherah pole from the Lord's temple and took it outside Jerusalem to the Kidron Valley, where he burned it. Then he ground the ashes of the pole to dust and threw the dust over the graves of the people. He also tore down the living quarters of the male and female shrine prostitutes that were inside the temple of the Lord, where the women wove coverings for the Asherah pole. Josiah brought to Jerusalem all the priests who were living in the other towns of Judah. He also defiled the pagan shrines where they had offered sacrifices all the way from Geba to Beersheba. He destroyed the shrines at the entrance to the gate of Joshua, the governor of Jerusalem. This gate was located to the left of the city gate as one enters the city. The priests who had served at the pagan shrines were not allowed to serve at the Lord's altar in Jerusalem, but they were allowed to eat unleavened bread with the other priests. Then the king defiled the altar of Topheth in the valley of Ben-Hinnom, so no one could ever again use it to sacrifice a son or daughter in the fire as an offering to Molech. He removed from the entrance of the Lord's temple the horse statue that the former kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun. They were near the quarters of Nathan, Melech, the eunuch, an officer of the court. The king also burned the chariots dedicated to the sun. Josiah tore down the altars that the kings of Judah had built on the palace roof above the upper room of Ahaz, The king destroyed the altars that Manasseh had built in the two courtyards of the Lord's temple. He smashed them to bits and scattered the pieces in the Kidron Valley. The king also desecrated the pagan shrines east of Jerusalem, to the south of the Mount of Corruption, where King Solomon of Israel had built shrines for Ashtoreth, the detestable goddess of the Sidonians, and for Chemosh, the detestable god of the Moabites, and for Molech, the vile god of the Ammonites. He smashed the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah poles. Then he desecrated these places by scattering human bones over them. The king also tore down the altar at Bethel, the pagan shrine that Jeroboam son of Nebat had made when he caused Israel to sin. He burned down the shrine and ground it to dust, and he burned the Asherah pole. 
Then Josiah turned around and noticed several tombs in the side of the hill. He ordered that the bones be brought out, and he burned them on the altar at Bethel. He desecrated it. This happened just as the Lord had promised through the man of God, when Jeroboam stood beside the altar at the festival. Then Josiah turned and looked up at the tomb of the man of God, who had practiced these things. What is that monument over there? Josiah asked. And the people of the town told him, It is the tomb of the man of God who came from Judah, and predicted the very things that you have just done to the altar at Bethel. Josiah replied, Leave it alone, don't disturb his bones. So they did not burn his bones, or those of the old prophet from Samaria. Then Josiah demolished all the buildings at the pagan shrines in the towns of Samaria, just as he had done at Bethel. They had been built by the various kings of Israel, and had made the Lord very angry. He executed the priests of the pagan shrines on their own altars, and he burned human bones on the altars to desecrate them. Finally, he returned to Jerusalem. King Josiah then issued this order to all the people. You must celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God as required in the Book of the Covenant. There had not been a Passover celebration like that since the time when the judges ruled in Israel, nor throughout all the years of the kings of Israel and Judah. But in the eighteenth year of King Josiah's reign, this Passover was celebrated to the Lord in Jerusalem. Josiah also got rid of the mediums and psychics, the household gods, the idols, and every other kind of detestable practice, both in Jerusalem and throughout the land of Judah. He did this in obedience to the laws written in the scroll that Hilkiah the priest had found in the Lord's temple. Never before had there been a king like Josiah, who turned to the Lord with all his heart and soul and strength, obeying all the laws of Moses, and there has never been a king like him since. Even so, the Lord was very angry with Judah because of all the wicked things Manasseh had done to provoke him. But the Lord said, I will also banish Judah from my presence, just as I have banished Israel. And I will reject my chosen city of Jerusalem and the temple where my name was to be honored. The rest of the events in Josiah's reign and all his deeds are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. While Josiah was king, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went to the Euphrates River to help the king of Assyria. King Josiah and his army marched out to fight him, but King Necho killed him when they met at Megiddo. Josiah's officers took his body back in a chariot from Megiddo to Jerusalem and buried him in his own tomb. Then the people of the land anointed Josiah's son, Jehoahaz, and made him the next king. Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. His mother was Hamatul, the daughter of Jeremiah from Libna. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestors had done. Pharaoh Necho put Jehoahaz in prison at Riblah in the land of Hamath to prevent him from ruling in Jerusalem. He also demanded that Judah pay 7,500 pounds of silver and 75 pounds of gold as tribute. Pharaoh Necho then installed Eliakim, another of Josiah's sons, to reign in the place of his father, and he changed Eliakim's name to Jehoiakim. Jehoahaz was taken to Egypt as a prisoner, where he died. In order to get the silver and gold demanded as tribute by Pharaoh Necho, Jehoiakim collected a tax from the people of Judah, requiring them to pay in proportion to their wealth. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. His mother was Zebedah, the daughter of Padiah from Ramah. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestors had done. 2 Chronicles 35 Then Josiah announced that the Passover of the Lord would be celebrated in Jerusalem. And so the Passover lamb was slaughtered on the fourteenth day of the first month. Josiah also assigned the priests to their duties and encouraged them in their work at the temple of the Lord. He issued this order to the Levites, who were to teach all Israel, and who had been set apart to serve the Lord. Put the holy ark in the temple that was built by Solomon, son of David, the king of Israel. You no longer need to carry it back and forth on your shoulders. Now spend your time serving the Lord your God and His people in Israel. Report for duty according to the family divisions of your ancestors, following the directions of King David of Israel and the directions of his son Solomon. Then stand in the sanctuary at the place appointed for your family divisions and help the families assigned to you as they bring their offerings to the temple. 
slaughter the Passover lambs, purify yourselves, and prepare to help those who come. Follow all the directions that the Lord gave through Moses. Then Josiah provided 30,000 lambs and young goats for the people's Passover offerings, along with 3,000 cattle, all from the king's own flocks and herds. The king's officials also made willing contributions to the people, priests, and Levites. Hilkiah, Zechariah, and Jehiel, the administrators of God's temple, gave the priest 2,600 lambs and young goats and 300 cattle as Passover offerings. The Levite leaders, Conaniah and his brothers, Shemaiah and Nethanel, as well as Heshabiah, Jael, and Josabad, gave 5,000 lambs and young goats and 500 cattle to the Levites for their Passover offerings. When everything was ready for the Passover celebration, the priest and the Levites took their places, organized by their divisions, as the king had commanded. The Levites then slaughtered the Passover lambs and presented the blood to the priest, who sprinkled the blood on the altar while the Levites prepared the animals. They divided the burnt offerings among the people by their family groups so they could offer them to the Lord as prescribed in the book of Moses. They did the same with the cattle. Then they roasted the Passover lambs as prescribed, and they boiled the holy offering in pots, kettles, and pans, and brought them out quickly so the people could eat them. Afterward, the Levites prepared Passover offerings for themselves and for the priest, the descendants of Aaron. Because the priest had been busy from morning till night offering the burnt offerings and the fat portions, the Levites took responsibility for all these preparations. The musicians, descendants of Asaph, were in their assigned places following the commands that had been given by David, Asaph, Haman, and Jeduthun, the king's seers. The gatekeepers guarded the gates and did not need to leave their post of duty, for their Passover offerings were prepared for them by their fellow Levites. The entire ceremony for the Lord's Passover was completed that day. All the burnt offerings were sacrificed on the altar of the Lord, as King Josiah had commanded. All the Israelites present in Jerusalem celebrated Passover and the festival of unleavened bread for seven days. Never since the time of the prophet Samuel had there been such a Passover. None of the kings of Israel had ever kept a Passover as Josiah did, involving all the priests and Levites, all the people of Jerusalem, and people from all over Judah and Israel. This Passover was celebrated in the 18th year of Josiah's reign. After Josiah had finished restoring the temple, King Necho of Egypt led his army up from Egypt to do battle at Carchemish on the Euphrates River, and Josiah and his army marched out to fight him. But King Necho sent messengers to Josiah with this message. What do you want with me, King of Judah? I have no quarrel with you today. I am on my way to fight another nation, and God has told me to hurry. Do not interfere with God who is with me, or you will be destroyed. But Josiah refused to listen to Necho, to whom God had indeed spoken, and he would not turn back. Instead, he disguised himself and led his army into battle on the plain of Megiddo. But the enemy archers hit King Josiah with their arrows and wounded him. He cried out to his men, Take me from the battle, for I am badly wounded. So they lifted Josiah out of his chariot and placed him in another chariot. Then they brought him back to Jerusalem, where he died. He was buried there in the royal cemetery, and all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for him. The prophet Jeremiah composed funeral songs for Josiah, and to this day choirs still sing these sad songs about his death. These songs of sorrow have become a tradition and are recorded in the Book of Laments. The rest of the events of Josiah's reign and his acts of devotion carried out according to what was written in the law of the Lord, from beginning to end, are all recorded in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. John 7 After this, Jesus traveled around Galilee. He wanted to stay out of Judea, where the Jewish leaders were plotting his death. But soon it was time for the Jewish festival of shelters. And Jesus' brother said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, where your followers can see your miracles. You can't become famous if you hide like this. If you can do such wonderful things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers didn't believe in him. Jesus replied, Now is not the right time for me to go. But you can go any time. The world can't hate you, but it does hate me. Because I accuse it of doing evil. You go on. I'm not going to this festival because my time has not yet come. After saying these things, Jesus remained in Galilee. 
But after his brothers left for the festival, Jesus also went, though secretly, staying out of public view. The Jewish leaders tried to find him at the festival and kept asking if anyone had seen him. There was a lot of grumbling about him among the crowds. Some argued, he's a good man, but others said, he's nothing but a fraud who deceives the people. But no one had the courage to speak favorably about him in public, for they were afraid of getting in trouble with the Jewish leaders. Then, midway through the festival, Jesus went up to the temple and began to teach. The people were surprised when they heard him. How does he know so much when he hasn't been trained, they asked. So Jesus told them, My message is not my own. It comes from God who sent me. Anyone who wants to do the will of God will know whether my teaching is from God or is merely my own. Those who speak for themselves want glory only for themselves. But a person who seeks to honor the one who sent him speaks truth, not lies. Moses gave you the law, but none of you obeys it. In fact, you're trying to kill me. The crowd replied, You're demon-possessed. Who's trying to kill you? Jesus replied, I did one miracle on the Sabbath, and you were amazed. But you work on the Sabbath, too, when you obey Moses' law of circumcision. Actually, this tradition of circumcision began with the patriarchs long before Moses. For if the correct time for circumcising your son falls on the Sabbath, you go ahead and do it so as not to break the law of Moses. So why should you be angry with me for healing a man on the Sabbath? Look beneath the surface so you can judge correctly. Some of the people who lived in Jerusalem started to ask each other, Isn't this the man they were trying to kill? But here he is speaking in public and they're saying nothing to him. Could our leaders possibly believe that he is the Messiah? But how could he be? For we know where this man comes from. When the Messiah comes, he will simply appear. No one will know where he comes from. While Jesus was teaching in the temple, he called out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I come from. But I'm not here on my own. The one who sent me is true, and you don't know him. But I know him because I come from him. And he sent me to you. Then the leaders tried to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his time had not yet come. Many among the crowds at the temple believed in him. After all, they said, would you expect the Messiah to do more miraculous signs than this man has done? When the Pharisees heard that the crowds were whispering such things, they and the leading priest sent temple guards to arrest Jesus. But Jesus told them, I will be with you only a little longer. Then I will return to the one who sent me. You will search for me, but not find me, and you cannot go where I am going. The Jewish leaders were puzzled by this statement. Where is he planning to go, they asked. Is he thinking of leaving the country and going to the Jews in other lands? Maybe he will even teach the Greeks. What does he mean when he says, You will search for me, but not find me, and you cannot go where I am going? On the last day, the climax of the festival... Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, Rivers of living water will flow from his heart. When he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit, who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the Spirit had not been given yet, because Jesus had not yet entered into his glory. When the crowds heard him say this, some of them declared, Surely this man is the prophet we've been expecting. Others said, He is the Messiah. Still others said, But he can't be. Will the Messiah come from Galilee? The scriptures clearly state that the Messiah will be born of the royal line of David, in Bethlehem, in the village where King David was born. So the crowd was divided about him. Some even wanted him arrested. But no one laid a hand on him. When the temple guards returned without having arrested Jesus, the leading priest and Pharisees demanded, Why didn't you bring him in? We have never heard anyone speak like this, the guards responded. Have you been led astray too? The Pharisees mocked. Is there a single one of us rulers or Pharisees who believes in him? This foolish crowd follows him, but they are ignorant of the law. God's curse is on them. Then Nicodemus, the leader who had met with Jesus earlier, spoke up. Is it legal to convict a man before he is given a hearing? He asked. They replied, are you from Galilee too? Search the scriptures and see for yourself. No prophet ever comes from Galilee. And now may our Lord, who searches for us and finds us, 
May he now give his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. During the festival of shelters, each day the priest would carry water up from the pool of Siloam. There are these steps that go from the pool all the way up to the gate of the temple and the bronze altar. And each day the priest would carry a jar of water, a gold jar of water, mix it with wine, and pour it out on the altar, and it would flow down the steps. The seventh and final day was the climax of the whole festival. This act of pouring out the water was a symbol of the Messianic age when the Messiah would come and would pour out his spirit upon all people. This is what Isaiah 44, 3 says, For I will pour out water to quench your thirst and irrigate your parched fields, and I will pour out my spirit on all your descendants and my blessing on your children. The act of the priest pouring out the water on the steps each day for seven successive days was a picture of the promise of Scripture that the Messiah would come and pour out his spirit upon all. Jesus uses this moment to stand there on the steps and shout to the crowd that he is the Messiah. He is the one this whole ceremony is about. It's all picturing him and what he would do, what he would offer the world. He says, in effect, if you believe that he is what the scriptures are all about, you will discover that you are what he is all about. And not just you, but every human being who's ever lived. And rivers of living water will pour from you out into this world, giving life and hope and bearing much fruit. Jesus has no interest in being famous like his brothers are goading him to. His interest was in what his father had asked him to do, to go, to seek, to save, to be lifted up and draw everyone to himself, to invite humanity into the relationship that he shares with the Father and the Spirit. And here he declares that he is the source of that living water. So let's come to him, to the source of our life that is abundant and free. And that's the prayer that I have for my own soul. That's the prayer that I have for my family, for my wife, my daughters, my son. And that's the prayer that I have for you. May it be so. Well, hey, do you want to get a hold of us? You can by going to the webpage, dailyradiobible.com. Right there. That's where you'll find us anytime you want. And another way to reach us is the old school way. That is through the U.S. Post. You can reach us at 2748 Northeast Molini Way. That's M-O-L-I-N-I Way, Hillsboro, Oregon 97124. So feel free to reach out to us. It's always great to hear from you. And I plan on letting you hear from me again tomorrow. Same time, same place. Lord willing and the creek don't rise, your brother Hunter plans on being here. Until that time, let's go forward. Let's go forward in God's joy. Let's let his joy be our strength. And let us always remember this, that you are loved. No doubt about it. Alrighty, I'll talk to you again tomorrow. You guys take care.